Gentlemen of the Pigs, it is Thursday, September the 26th, 2019. Uh, still going over week 24 here. Uh, we put out a pair of videos yesterday in reference to the semifinal matchups for the Bigs Championship this year. Today we're going to go over the remaining four consolation matchups as well as uh, the best and worst of the week. We'll get into some his historic matchups and probably close out with some more housekeeping along with a, a, a guest somewhere along the way. Um, with me, as always, Benjamin Aloysius Nisman. How are you, sir? I'm good, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Uh, looking forward to an exciting final here. Uh, an amazing season from every competitor. All 16 of us did uh, just worked so damn hard. And... You know, we're going to really get into how we can make this league a little bit better as we try to every single year, just making little changes along the way. Uh, there, it, it seems over the last four or five years, we've at least made one change, and it seems like each one has been a home run. So um, looking forward to talking about that. And uh, still some interesting uh, matchups because it just seems that the managers, even though they're eliminated, they don't want to stop playing, Joe. Yeah, I mean, it, listen, fantasy baseball is sort of an addiction as soon as you get this deep into it. Um, I know it has been for me. And it's, you know, it's the case of, of man, I don't want this season to be over. Like, I was saying to uh, I was saying to Frank Bucco today, the other day, I was like, you know, I already miss baseball season. It's not even over yet. You know, I don't want this. I don't... Like, this is the first time I haven't been playing meaningful baseball or fantasy baseball this late in the season in three, four years. And I'm disappointed. And I'm disappointed that the season's already over and that, you know, I have to look at, look to next season. I have to look to the off season. I have to look to the postseason first. You know, our Mets got eliminated from playoff contention yesterday. Um, you know... It, it's good to at least be playing meaningful baseball in September. Um, but that's ultimately not the goal of our team. I look forward to, oh. to, to seeing what happens in the playoffs. Um, and for what it's worth, uh, Ben and I were just talking off air. This show will not end when the fantasy baseball season ends. You know, we're going to talk about the playoffs. We're going to talk about the off season. We're going to talk about the uh, regular season awards. We're going to talk about... You know, the winter meetings. We're going to talk about the free agency. We're going to talk about everything leading back up to next season. You know, this is this is something that that, that, that we've created that I really, really believe in. And and I look forward to, to everybody's opinions in the offseason. That being said, I'll have to find a way to get it out to everybody. Um, I would imagine Twitter is probably going to be the best option there. Um, in which case... You know, I'll, I'll post up my uh, my Twitter handle that I'll be that I'll be using to to promote these videos. But that's another story for another matter. Um, Benji, you want to jump into some consolation bracket matchups? Yeah, let's do it because it seems like it was meaningful to them. So if it's meaningful to them, it's meaningful to us. Well, for the final matchup of the year for both James McCloskey and Bobby Russo. Uh, this was the fifth place matchup. You know, and this one ended 10-9, but because Bobby didn't make the minimum, it ends up looking a little bit lopsided in 17-5. to uh, Either way, James McCloskey will finish fifth this year. Bobby Russo will finish in the sixth place spot. Two great seasons from each of them. Close categories this week. I'm not even going to count um, pitching categories because, again, Bobby didn't make the minimum. Bobby did win by a triple and five ticks on the on-base percentage. James wins by two steals. They didn't tie in anything. Uh, James made this week incredibly easy for me to calculate all of his all of his uh, offensive stats because he finished the season with exactly 10 offensive players. So every day, he didn't have anybody on the bench because he didn't have an offensive bench. Um, for Bobby, he went three for 15. That's a 200 batting average on his bench. A run, a homer, an RBI, and two strikeouts. None of that played. At the end of the day, this is fairly straightforward matchup. There's not a whole lot to talk about here. Um, you know, we could jump to key players unless you've got something to to 
to add in here. Yeah, no, what else can I say except for the fact that we don't know what the heck it really would have been if these guys could make ads and drops. Right. It's possible James would have won anyway, or it's possible that Bobby would have killed them. Mm -hmm. You know, you have no idea because when guys have the ability to make moves, they can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. They can make their team even worse. They can, you know, improve their team by making great moves. With the 13 that you have, there's still a lot that could be done. It just... It would change the game for, you know, myself, for you, mm -hmm. for Mike Haver, for Jason. Everything would have been different. Sure. So, I mean, yeah, let's I, let's get into key, key players then because, okay. you know, they still were players that performed. And, sure. and it's good to know for next season. Yep. All right. For uh, for James's team who won the week, uh, Aaron Judge gave him a good week. 316 average, 409 on base. Six runs, two doubles, three homers, four RBIs, three walks, and eight strikeouts. Uh, Cody Bellinger, as it has been all season, he's a key player here. 250 average, 318 on base. Six runs, three doubles, two homers, six RBIs, two steals, two walks, four strikeouts, and two errors. And finally, finally Johnny VR, who might be the MVP of Baltimore this season. You know, he's, he's just... Arguably the best player in that on that team, and I don't even think it's close. Like he's gonna finish this season with twenty five homers and forty steals. That's an amazing season, you know. And he's not getting a single bit of credit here. Uh, this week, two thirty three average, three hundred three on base, six runs, a double, a triple, two homers, two RBIs, three steals, two walks, nine strikeouts, and an error. You know, offensively for James all season, you know, it was a, it was, it was, let's, let's get the power. And again, he does it again this week, you know, almost doubles up Bobby and homers and, you know, runs, wins runs and doubles and RBIs and still takes down steals as well because he's got a, he's got a really solid team. He put together a really solid team to finish out this season. Pitching wise for him. First of all, I want to give credit where it's due. He threw almost 60 innings and had a 2.62 ERA. You know, 64 strikeouts, a 5 and 2 record, an 0.94 WHIP. He won WHIP outright against a team that only threw 23 and in two thirds. Bobby was, you know, what is that? 13 or 12 and a or 13 and a third innings away from the minimum. You know, his ERA was ridiculously low, but his WHIP still couldn't couldn't beat James. In more than double the innings. Um, Marco Gonzalez, who we talked about many times on the show, was a guy that James picked up after he had already won 10 games. And he said, you know, this guy's got at least four more wins in him. Um, as it was, he had six more wins in him. Um, 14 innings, a win, a loss, a homer given up, two walks, eight strikeouts, a 129 ERA. An 079 whip. Uh, Eduardo Rodriguez gets what his 19th win on the season. Uh, six innings, 10 strikeouts, an 067 whip with two walks. And finally, Sonny Gray, six and two thirds, nine strikeouts, three walks, a 270 ERA, a 105 whip. Uh, that was his, uh, it, it was a loss, but he's got 11 wins on the season and an ERA south of three. That guy is going to finish the season for James incredibly, uh, incredibly better than I think a lot of people gave him credit for. Um, any thoughts on yeah, James? I mean, yeah, James, there you go. James was a uh, pretty good around, like across the board all year in pitching. Mm -hmm. As far as facing against his opponents, or as we closed the books on him, but we could still talk about the fact that he was over 500 in basically everything. 13, mm -hmm. 10 innings pitched, 11 and 9 in wins, 12 and 10 in losses. Even three and one in complete games, yeah. fourteen and nine in saves, twelve and ten in home runs given up, uh, thirteen and ten in strikeouts, sixteen and eight in ERA, fourteen and ten in WHIP. Uh, I mean, these are just good numbers, you know. If anything else is under five hundred, who cares, you know? For the most part, he's competing with his opponents, and when his offense did what his offense did all year, this is the result. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we've talked in the past about James being um, one of those managers, along with Bobby, that sort of broke through a glass ceiling this year. And, I, yes. you know, I remember we were Jason talking. Jason, too. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, when we talked about um, James getting eliminated after his after his uh, quarterfinal matchup against against Jason, we we sort of talked about how, especially recapping his draft, that it was a it was a very good draft, you know, hampered by a ton of injuries and a just absolute lack of a bullpen. You know, I think I think going forward, James has a real idea of. You know how he wants to target his pitching staff again next year, and while still living by a a a philosophy of of power and speed combinations that he put together this season. Sure, I I don't think that's why he wasn't in the final four though. No, 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 no. A no. lack of a bullpen. I mean, he he missed out on that opportunity. Yeah, it was there for him. It was, it was. No, it, taking this taking this experience and applying it going forward, I think James is going to do quite well, um, you know, it, as far as drafting is concerned. It'll be interesting to yeah. see if, you know, the, the day-to-day management, the, the strategy that goes into late week, you know, late week uh, matchup strategy is, is something that he's going to, going to master. Because, like we talked about, there were opportunities for him to go get the categories needed late in the week, and yeah, he just didn't. And you know, I think that comes with a lack of experience. Um, yeah. So we'll see next year if he's capable of doing that. For Bobby, you know, obviously we can we can pretty much tell that I don't think Bobby was uh, was overly. Uh, competitive this week, you know, as far as going for the minimum or trying to 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 get the get the fifth place spot, he earned that right. I'm not going to fault him for it. Um, this year, his team was, you know, I, I think his team was 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 obviously benefited by a couple of career years in Josh Bell and Cattell Marte. Um, and when you're anchored, Mike with, Trout had a career year in some ways. Yeah, you know? I was just about to say. And when you're anchored with Mike Trout hitting the most home runs he's ever had in his career, you know you're 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 in for a good season. Um, I just I look at Bobby's team and how it performed the for like for the uh, for the season. You know the head to head matchups, and it's a lot of. Um, it's a lot of surprising numbers that you wouldn't expect. Like, you would expect a team that has Mike Trout and has and goes sixteen and eight in walks on the season to be better than five hundred and on base percentage. And I'm not quite sure where the um, shortcomings were in the in the batting average department because he was four games under five hundred there. You know, it's like where. Where where were the 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 bad hitters on his team that led him to a season long two fifty seven batting average? Well, it possibly was just the timing of playing certain guys. Mm-hmm. You know, I realized that Gardner had a good season. You know, but mm-hmm. Bobby missed out on Gardner a couple of times. You know, I, sure. I remember that specifically. You know, there were opportunities to play possibly Kettle Marte early in the season, mm-hmm. um, but you didn't know he's a superstar yet. So, you know, I I don't recall because at some point we should go back, you know, and just have a record of everything that was on the bench and just like keep a tab, like keep oh, sure. like complete tabs on all of it and just see like add them all up and at the end of so. Oh, in week one they're like a minus three. You know, mm-hmm. if they cost themselves arguably three stats with like leaving guys oh, on the right. bench, that would be a cool thing to like do yeah, and then add up. That's and an idea like, for oh, a show. That'll be coming. Weeks. I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in this case, I think it's interesting that, you know, you say he earned the right to, uh, you know, not necessarily participate. And mm-hmm. I completely agree, but this just goes um, as far as the, when we talk about. Well, is it right to lock up teams that do want to play? Well, there are some teams that don't care. So mm-hmm. if that's the case, I don't know if it's necessarily an even playing field. And that ultimately led to the decision of just locking whoever isn't playing for the World Series. Right, right. And and when you look at something like this, you know, would it be right for 
you know, especially last week while this matchup is going on, while you and I and Mike and Jason are fighting for, for a championship, if James McCloskey is picking up pitchers to go against Bobby, who's not playing, does that even make sense? That that doesn't even that's not even competitive. That's not a competitive matchup. And the pickups that James would be making would be blocking the the four guys who are fighting for the championship. And it just right. I, I, at the end of the day, I'm 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 slowly but surely coming to this coming full fully over to the side of this is the right decision to make. Like shutting down these teams that aren't playing and that that aren't competing for the championship. I think is the right move here. Yeah. Um for Bobby's key players this week. And again, it's it's difficult to to pinpoint them because you know, again, he didn't exactly he, he didn't put forth a full effort. So, um you know, Jerks and Profar giving him a 333 average, a 385 on base. A run, a double, a triple, an RBI, a steal, a walk, and two strikeouts. Uh, Kettle Marte, 500 average and on base. A run, two doubles, and RBI. And Brett Gardner, uh, 348 average, 400 on base. Five runs, a double, two homers, six RBIs, a walk, and five strikeouts. Pitching-wise, it looks like Bobby had Cole and Syndergaard on the bench, which contributed to his 23 and two-thirds over a week. Um, so it's even more difficult to find pitchers that, that gave him anything. Um, Roberto Osuna was great for him. Max Freed gave him the only win of the week and Ryan Brazier, uh, you know, tied for the team lead in relief appearances and he had seven strikeouts, which tied for the team lead. Uh, to, to, to just put a bow on this matchup. Thank you guys for a fantastic season. Um, I, I look forward to competing against you guys next year. Yeah, I have to agree. I just uh, thanks a lot, guys. It's unbelievable how much hard work you put in. Um, I can't thank you enough because you know that's what makes the league so much better. The fact that no matter who you're facing on the schedule, you say, "Well, this guy's going to use at least a, you know a handful of moves or whatever and try mm-hmm. and beat me." He's trying. You know, and that's what makes it amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With that, uh, let's jump over to the 8-9 matchup uh, between Jimmy Dunlap and Ari Nisman. Uh, and, you know, for for everything we talked about as the playoffs were getting started when Jimmy posted on the, uh, on the boards that he wasn't going to be competing, he competed. And he took down a 12-7 win over Ari this week. Um, close categories. Jimmy wins by a triple. Two walks and a win. Ari wins by a save. Uh, two walks given up by a pitcher and 12 ticks on the ERA. They tied in homers and losses. Uh, for Jimmy this week, it was a 13 for 42 day a week on his bench. Uh, that's a 310 batting average with 12 runs, four doubles, four homers, 12 RBIs, three walks, 11 strikeouts, and two errors. At the end of the day... The only thing that really plays is the four homers. I didn't particularly get into, you know, day by day what things he should have done. You know, again, when it's the playoffs, I was much more focused on, you know, day to day figuring out how I can try to get back back into this matchup against my co-host, who really took it to me this week. Um, so I don't know if we want to break down day by day for this, but I didn't. You know, I didn't go that far with this. Sorry to hear that. I, I yeah. mean, I'm, it's just, it's funny because we were just talking about how we both agree that it's necessary to lock out who's ever eliminated from playing in the World Series. Mm. Well, now you have two guys that are competing. Mm-hmm. You said that Jimmy, you know, we said that Jimmy said that he wasn't going to compete. Well, maybe that, you know, bug, that addiction that you referred to got to him and he knows that his team is still out there and he knows he has a matchup and he can't help himself. Yeah. So now I want to ask you on the other side, where's where they're coming from? If you could speak on the behalf of anyone that says, 
like no like you should let anyone that still has a matchup or still um, not even if they have the buy for mm-hmm. the consolation bracket they should still be entitled to make their ads and drops to compete because it's for fun well the one thing that I uh, that I noticed very early on in this matchup was that and, and it wasn't even something I had thought of before this moment but Jimmy has two guys on his DL that are active and he can't even activate them to play because his roster is full and he would have to drop a guy in order to in order to activate them. Those guys being Max Muncy and Keston Hira. You know, if he could get if in order to even get these these guys into the lineup, he would have to drop somebody off of his roster and maybe that's you know, maybe that's somebody like uh, Nick Anderson, the reliever in, in Tampa. Maybe that's, you know, uh, Colt Wong. Maybe that's uh, somebody else. But these guys in his on his team can't even be played for this matchup, and he can't do anything about it because he can't drop anybody. Even just giving him the option to drop two guys and get these guys activated onto his roster doesn't work because these are, you know, these are like, I remember texting you saying, hey, Keston here is playing. Jimmy can't even activate him because he has to drop a guy. And your response was, yeah, but that's a guy, whoever it is, that wouldn't have been in the free agent pool otherwise. Right. Yeah, it's important because whoever is dropped, they make, they make a difference. Mm-hmm. You know, all of a sudden they're a playable guy. Unless no one ends up adding that guy, but why take that chance? Yeah. You know, it's at the same time, it, it just has to go either, we can't go halfway with it. We mm-hmm. either have to lock anyone or leave everyone available to make their ads and drops. We can't go halfway with it. Right, right. Um. For Ari this week on his bench, 16 for 44. That's a 364 batting average. Seven runs, two homers, seven RBIs, a steal, three walks, and five strikeouts. Um, again, I didn't exactly get to um, what he would have had to do to, to, to flip a couple categories. It was more just a compilation of what their stats were every day. Um, and that's kind of how it is for the other three consolation matchups. Um, here in, in, for the rest of this, um, uh, mostly because it was, again, something that I was, I was, I was paying more attention to my own team and things that I, I needed to do to try to get back into my matchup rather than, than diving, you know, headlong into Ari's like seven for 14 day on the bench on Saturday. Um, we can jump to key players if you like, or we if you've uh, if you've got something else here. You know, it just goes to show how much hard work has to go into when you have a playoff matchup mm. that like it's just so impossible to focus on other oh, yeah. things yeah. like in your everyday life. Um, mm. You know, our guest who comes on, and I want to leave the guest as a surprise. Sure. Um, you know, has a history of time where it's you know. Things were so distracted from him that, he, you know, because he had to play fantasy baseball. Mm-hmm. So, um, I um, I just find it hilarious that, like, someone who, you know, can keep on top of everything as far as the ads, the drops, leaving whatever on the bench and um, how it affected them. This week was just a whole different story for you because of what was oh, yeah. happening. Well, I mean, when you're this close to a third championship, you know, I had to put some things to yeah. the back burner, and that was it. You know, I'm yeah. like, I'm like, so, you know, some of these matchups in the constellation bracket are are incredibly competitive. You know, my apologies to these guys, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm fighting for a title, and and I, yeah. you know, you should be sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Benny, that I said I would whoop your ass, and I didn't. <laughs> Uh, to the to the point about I brought up about uh, Jimmy not being able to activate Muncie or Hira. This one is interesting because Ari wasn't able to activate Craig Kimbrell, but it actually benefited him because Craig Kimbrell has been like 
unmitigated hot garbage since coming off the DL. You know, that series against St. Louis where he where he gave up back-to-back homers to lose a game and, like, lost a game a couple of days prior. You know, he's been absolute just dog shit since coming back from the DL. And Ari couldn't get him in the lineup because he's got a full roster. So there's something there to be said about, you know, it benefiting him. Um, you know, especially considering he won, you know, homers by three and ERA by 12 ticks. Um, had he been playing Craig Kimbrell, which of course you're going to, um, he would have ended up tying homers. He ended up, he probably absolutely would have been losing ERA, you know, so Jimmy would have been uh, a much bigger, a much, it would have been a much bigger win for, for Jimmy here. Um, key players this week for Jimmy who won the week. I'm going to highlight Tim, uh, Tommy Edmond. 423 average, 483 on base, seven runs, a double, two triples, a homer, two RBIs, two steals, a walk, seven strikeouts, and an error. Where did this kid come from? Like, is he really the next like David Eckstein, or what is this? What is this kid? Because he's got what looks like about a 10 game hitting streak, and every single one of them is a multi hit game. Yeah. It's just- the St. Louis Cardinals doing business as usual, just knowing how to pick pick them in the draft and spit them out there, and all of a sudden they're major leaguers, whoever they are. The fireball that they throw in, even if for a couple of years, you know, and then mm-hmm. they disappear. Um, John Jay, you know, he was hot for them for a little bit. Right. They need to scale, so, mm-hmm. you know. Um, Jeremy Hazelbaker. Uh, even, um, yeah, them. there you go, yeah. Hazel Bay. Um, as far as pitching, how about Trevor Rosenthal? Yeah, you know they just find him. You know, uh-huh. Jason Mott. I, that, that you know, was just, just about whoever it is. It's just they pick them. They're they're good for a little bit. As far as they need them to go, mm-hmm. get them into a playoffs every so often, and uh, there you go. That's, that's the Cardinals' way, and they just they have like a really model franchise. You know, just mm-hmm. and um, Jesse. You know, dear friend, family friend of mine, uh, he's been watching baseball, you know, way before we were born. Mm-hmm. And he says as a, ki- as a kid, you know, and he's in his 70s, and he said as a kid, the St. Louis Cardinals were always good. They huh. just always were good, you know, no matter what. And then even going further, like the Bob Gibson days. And right. That's what it is. Like, it's a, a, a franchise you wish you're a fan of. It's, it's almost envy and jealousy sometimes. Yeah, it's the it's the National League's equivalent to the New York Yankees, right? They've got the most the most World Series wins in the NL, uh, the most appearances. Yeah. You know, they they they're perennially a, a franchise that is in the playoff hunt. Like I can't remember a time that they weren't good. So, yeah. um, and and to to find this kid who again when I when I watch him play, he reminds me of David Eckstein. It's 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 uncanny how much it, this this guy reminds me of David Eckstein, but Eckstein never had this kind of power. Like he's got eleven homers in the short time he's been up, and he's got fourteen steals. Like right. you extrapolate that out, this all of a sudden this dude's a thirty thirty guy. Like, there's yeah, no way. So he's more of like an Eric Burns type. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Alex Bregman also gave Jimmy a good week: two thirty five average, three eighty one on base. Three runs, three homers, four RBIs, three walks, three strikeouts. And finally, Tim Anderson, 375 average, 385 on base. Four runs, a double, two homers, three RBIs, a steal, a walk, and four strikeouts. Offensively, Jimmy had himself a good week. Hit over 300, batting average over 375, seven steals, nine homers, three triples, you know, the thing that's surprising to me, though, is that he only drove in 17 runs over the week. You know, so he was getting he was getting the power, but there was nobody on base for him. Like there was nobody there's right. nobody in, ahead of him to 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 score to to be driven in. So, uh, pitching wise for Jimmy Lance Lynn, another great year or another great week. 12 and a third, a win, a loss, three homers, two walks, 20 strikeouts, a 438 ERA, a 130 whip. At the end of the day, Jimmy won innings, wins, strikeouts, whip, and relief appearances. So I'm going to highlight guys like that, um, the the high strikeout guys. 
Uh, Tyler Duffy, four and two thirds, eight strikeouts, five relief appearances, nothing earned, and no whip. So he went four and two thirds. That's 14 batters to get out. He struck out eight of them. Didn't walk a guy, didn't give up a hit, five relief uh, across five relief appearances. That's a start. Amazing. That's a start. Like that's that is a that is a damn near quality start from a bunch of relief appearances. Um and Luis Castillo, seven innings, seven strikeouts, two homers, three walks, and a loss, 386 ERA and 086 whip. For Ari this week, uh Starlin Castro gave him a good week, 375 average, 407 on base. Five runs, four doubles, a triple, two homers, five RBIs, two walks, four strikeouts, and an error. Ahmed Rosario, who's like having a second half that is really impressive. And I expect really big things from this kid next season. You know, he's he's sitting at 15 homers and 19 steals. He'll probably finish with about 15 and 20. And if he can take the next step next year... And maybe go 20-30. I'll be incredibly impressed. But even if this is what we're getting out of a out of a bottom of the order hitter in the Mets lineup, you know, 285 average, 15 homers, 70 RBIs, 20 steals. That's really good. That is really good. This week, yeah. This week, 304 average and on base, two runs, two doubles, two homers, five RBIs, a steal, two two strikeouts, and an error. Um Talk to me about what it's what what they're saying back east about Rosario here as as the season winds down. I think just that there's been a huge improvement, and it's so obvious and so clear how much more of a confident hitter he is, mm-hmm. and how much more he's looking like a real major league shortstop. That's basically the consensus that you know it didn't seem like Rosario was going to be a hitter even though in minors it seemed like that's you know that's his thing he's a great hitter and he was showing you know last year and other years that he has a really long swing mm-hmm. and he's going to strike out a lot and maybe his swing won't work in the major leagues but just the fact that he's you know picked it up so much in the second half and he's shown that he can go on an, a, a legitimate hot streak is exciting to see. And that he's quick, and that he's athletic, and that you've seen that he can play center field. Um, that, you know, who's to say that that's not his position? Who's to say that he's not a second baseman? I, I, whatever it is, right. it's clear that he's an athlete, mm-hmm. you know, and it's clear that he's getting better. And he's only 24 years old, I'm pretty sure, at most. Maybe 23. Uh, he's 23 so, now. Um, he will be 24 uh, in November. Okay. So he's he's finishing his age 23 season. Mm-hmm. So a lot to look forward to. I mean, extremely young and only getting better. That's just, I mean, anyone can see it. They look at the numbers in the second half. Yeah. I, I, I have him here in front of me. You know, before the All-Star break... He was hitting 260 with a 299 on base, nine homers, 42 RBIs, and 10 steals. Since then, 320 average, 353 on base percentage, six homers, 29 RBIs, and nine steals. You know, he's yeah. he's almost equaled his doubles totals uh, since the All Star break to beforehand. Um, he has more hits post All Star break than he did before. Uh, run totals is almost equal. And the thing is, like, you hear those numbers and you're like, okay, well, yeah, it's about the same number of games, right? Wrong. 21 more games before the All-Star break than after. So he's doing all of this and equaling these numbers in fewer games. The one thing I would love to see him do and improve upon is walk. Holy shit, I want this kid to walk. You know, he's got all of 31 walks on the season in 150 games. You know, if you look at him, his monthly breakdown, monthly breakdown, one walk in March, six walks in April, seven walks in May, four walks in June, six walks in July, four, four walks in August, and three walks in September. There are guys who get 30 walks in a month. 
And this guy's got yeah, 31 in the sure. season. You know, I want to see I this kid. No, he's the ideal leadoff hitter if he can, you know, improve on that. Yeah. And there was times when he was in the leadoff spot. So maybe if that's the spot that he's meant to be in in the batting order, mm. and it seems like he hits wherever, but I do like him there in the leadoff spot, to be honest with you. So if that's a spot, maybe he does improve on that. Maybe he becomes less aggressive. Uh, the other thing that I forgot to mention uh, when we were hearing through the translator is that one thing with his swing and his approach is that he would let the ball get deeper now. You know, he would kind of chase for it, but mm. now it's just about letting the ball come in just a little bit more before he starts everything with his swing. So that was one thing interesting that I remember. Hmm. Um, to just finally put a bow on this kid, I just found another set of interesting numbers. Against against the Atlanta Braves alone, he has 71 at-bats. He has zero walks against that team, 21 strikeouts. And you're like, oh, God, he must be batting like 120 or 130, right? Wrong. 338 batting average against these guys. A homer, a triple, five doubles, 24 hits in those 71 at-bats, and 13 runs scored. He is owning the Atlanta Braves pitching staff. He's just not walking at all against them. Um, his most walks against a team is Miami with four. Uh, to to get off the Ahmed Rosario train, uh, we'll jump over to Vlad Guerrero, who, who for Ari this week, a 417 average and on base, two doubles, three RBIs, three strikeouts. Um, for Ari, it was a it was a, it was a really really disappointing season. If 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 I'm thinking that he wanted to, you know, I'm sure he wanted to be up in the up in the top of the the leaderboard every single week. But I think his roster construction, and I think we talked about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago. When he drafted, he got really cute and went with you know uh, uh, the the top rookie and the free agents, both of them. And held on to injured guys, and his roster construction just did not did not give him the opportunity to succeed. Um, yeah, I think that also when you hold roster spots down on guys that aren't performing hmm. or you know aren't going to be active for a while, we we said that he was also married to a David Robertson for too long, mm-hmm. to a Dylan Patances for too long. And Ari, it's okay that he didn't make a ton of ads each week. You know, not everyone uses 11 or 12 or 13 a week. That's right. fine. But I do think there's something to be said of having all 25 on your roster have a purpose. To act, to you be know? active. And that yeah. was always, yeah. that was always my thing that, you know, you should always say, there's a reason this guy is on my team. Mm-hmm. Well, if he's on the DL, you know, then he needs to be in a DL spot. But if he's just filling up a spot because both of your DL spots are filled, then you still have to have a purpose. Like, mm-hmm. there has to be a reason. Well, either he's coming back or he's a superstar, and you therefore you have to live with playing with 24 for another week or two. Mm-hmm. It, it happens. You know, it happens. But, you know, just like, you know, we said like in the playoffs how, you know, there are certain times where in a given day, you know, in your lineup, in your rotation, in your bullpen, like everyone needs to mean something. No one should be wasted if they're not going to play like they should sit, right. you know? So it's sort of the same thing here, like going week to week, like every guy that you're going to have in your roster, in your 25 and next year, it's going to be 26. Mm-hmm. They all have to mean something or they're just wasting space. And a lot of times, maybe Ari felt like he was reaching to get the minimum. I know there were times where, like, we'd go into Friday that he'd only have about, like, 10 or 12 innings. Mm -hmm. And he has to, like, make it work for the weekend. And that's fine. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But maybe you don't need to reach for the bottom of the barrel so much the weekend. If you had something working for you during the week, that's a roster spot that was filled by a Robertson, a Batanzas, a Kimbrough, and whatnot. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we talked about the 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 log jam on his offense. We've talked about you know his his long bench, and to just sort of go with such a short pitching staff for most of the season, 
it ended up hurting him, in my opinion. Um, Pitching-wise for him this week, uh, I don't know who Eric Swanson is, but he got two saves for Seattle this week. Uh, two relief appearances, four strikeouts, and a walk in two innings. Uh, Anthony DeSclafani was really good. Six innings, a walk, seven strikeouts, a 150 ERA, and 067 whip. Uh, that start, of course, came against who, Benjamin? Uh, I don't want to know. It's the New York Mets. It was a no decision. The Mets uh, ended up losing that game. It was the 3-2 game uh, that, yeah. that uh, I believe it was... Oh, yeah. This was the game where... Uh, where Wheeler uh, Wheeler got an RBI and Brandon Nimmo got hit by a pitch for an RBI and Christian Colon, yeah. you know, won the game in the bottom of the eighth with a single. That was that game. That's right. Yeah. Um, and finally, Jeff Samarja, six innings, a win, a homer, four walks, two strikeouts, a 150 ERA, and a one whip. Ari did piece together a, a pretty serviceable rotation. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, but I respect the willingness to uh, hold on to Keiko as mm-hmm. long as we did and Kimbo. Mm-hmm. I respect the I respect the, the the willingness to. I just don't think that it's a it's a. It just wasn't a mo- uh, to have both of them on the same team. Like I could understand having one that fills your NA spot. You know, it's not hurting your roster. You 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 drafted one of them. But to go with both of them now, you're now like you like you talked about with Patances and Robertson. Now they're just eating into roster space. You're just eating into, you know, your 25 that you're going to war with every week. And it was it wasn't like this was oh this was a couple of weeks into the season. Like these guys didn't sign until what June, July. Yeah. Like it was damn near the All Star I- break when these guys signed. I think that if it was just the Kimbo and just the Keiko, just the two of them and having both of them, I personally think he still would have been okay. It was that the Tansis and Robertson also had to be there. So it was almost like four yeah. were getting blocked. Yeah, was- so like, okay, put one in your NA, one will waste the roster spot, and now use your DL spots on guys that, um, if they're going to come back, they'll be meaningful because mm-hmm. like relievers... The Tansis, Robertson, they're good relievers, but you can find other good relievers that are healthy yeah, um, and that are going to perform right now, you know? And you can use those DL spots on a, an Ender and Ciarte if he's hurt, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever it was, you know? But, like, I, I just thought that the DL spots on relief pitching, unless he really thought that, you know, they're going to be closers at some point, maybe, but I don't know. Um, it just uh, it, it seemed like there was just too much of a blocking of other things that he could have potentially done week to week to try to win him a stat here and there. Yeah, I completely agree. And it was clear that when those guys came back from the DL, or uh, when they did get signed, rather, the Keikles and the Kimbrels, Ari took off a little bit, and he started to win more, and he was mm-hmm. trying to knock off a few in a row, and he almost made that incredible comeback. Sure, sure. It's just, it's it's disappointing that the the hot streak comes... But he's just dug himself way too deep at that point, you know, and and it's 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 back to that 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 deep bench that he plays with the log jam between third base and, and utility that sort of kept Shohei Otani out of the lineup, and you know it's it's just it was a it was a it was a strategy that as we talked about has worked for Ari in the past with the long bench and things of that nature it just didn't work this year because of his roster construction above all else. And for Jimmy, you know, for for we we talked about a couple of weeks ago the message he posted on the board saying that you know he he wasn't going to compete and that he was done. Hey, let's give him credit. He still came and competed this week. Um, so thank you for that, Jimmy. We we certainly appreciate the hard work you put in. Um, and I think there's something to be said that you know he's now in the in the finals of the the consolation bracket, and I know. It doesn't mean anything, but for me, the, the 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 few times that I haven't made the playoffs, that consolation bracket does mean something to me just to say that, okay, I won my final week of the year, and I won a tournament. You know, I won something. It means something to me. And maybe that's what it is for Jimmy here. 
Uh, I would hope so, anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I feel the same way about you in our past when we were, you know, in our 20s and early 20s, and we had the ability to make ads and drops for the consolation bracket. Um, I don't know what it would mean now, but Mm -hmm. it does mean something, these two guys. And, you know, I appreciate the hard work from them as well, as well as not just from this week, uh, but through the whole season. I've mentioned again, Ari is is extremely busy, but he loves doing this shit, so he's going to keep doing it. And Jimmy, it just seems the same thing, that he's kind of hooked. So regardless of how much it matters and what who's going to remember who gets seventh place or whatnot, they're playing fantasy baseball to the best of their ability, mm-hmm. regardless of their restrictions. Right. Nobody's going to remember next year who finished 7th, but you know who will? The guy who finished 7th will. And that's, you know, it's something of pride. So, you know, it's something to be said for 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 playing your ass off this this late when, you know, you're fighting for a 7th place finish. Uh, with that, we can jump off to the the other uh what was the 7-10 matchup? Uh, Jose told a story, Chris Levy, who took down a 9-8 win over Kershaw for pass over Mike Sherman. Uh, close categories this week. Chris wins by five ticks on the batting average. Mike wins by a homer, and they tied in triples, RBIs, steals, and errors. Um, for Chris this week, a 10 for 51 batting average, or a 10 for 51 performance that's a 196 batting average, five runs, a homer, two RBIs. Two walks and 14 strikeouts. The two RBIs are the big thing that plays. They all came on one day, which was Thursday the 19th. Uh, I don't even know who it was. Uh, hmm. It was Lourdes Guriel on the bench. Uh, so maybe... Yeah, I, again, these, these rosters are difficult to see because, you know... Rich Hill is still on the DL, but he's activated. Um, you know, Chris has a, f- a few things on the bench that you would have liked to see to get into the lineup. Doesn't look like he was as active as you know some of our other, our, our other managers, uh, especially when you consider that you know Lucas Giolito's on the DL, so he could activate Rich Hill if he pitched. Um, some of these. Some of these bench players never saw the lineup, um, but you know he's still. He able asked to... about that. He was wondering why he wasn't able to, and I. So like I do know that there was an attempt. Okay. To uh, work on his team this week. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, and, but and... you can see, you could see like with Ari and with Jimmy, like when you said, like you said mm-hmm. that he was going to compete, he did. What he did. you mean by that is like that you can tell that day by day mm. that guys in their rosters were moved around. Right. And and the thing is like some of these some of these guys on Thursday have absolutely no nothing stopping them from getting in the lineup but they're not. Right? Uh on on Thursday the 19th, Guriel, Vogelback and Fletcher are all on the bench. There's there's only four games that day. You know, there's only he only has five players active because they don't they don't they're not scheduled for games so it's you know it's a case of okay doesn't look like this is this is you know something that he's active in at this moment um the same is true of mike haber or i'm sorry mike sherman you know evan longoria was on the bench the same day and there was nothing stopping him from playing him over danny santana who was not who wasn't scheduled for a game so okay you know it's 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 a case of was it was it a, was it a full week of competition or was it a pick and choose your spot? You know, I think it's more of that. Yeah. I think it's more of the latter. Yeah. Um, key players this week, or I'm sorry for uh, for Mike this week. Two for seven, uh, two for seven performance on his bench. It's two eighty six batting average, a run, an RBI, four walks, and four strikeouts. Um, key players this week for Chris. It's going to be David Fletcher, uh, four hundred average and on base. Three runs, a homer, two RBIs. Uh, Eduardo Escobar, uh, 320 average, 370 on base, four runs, two doubles. A homer, four RBIs, two walks, and three strikeouts. And finally, Aristides Aquino, 250 average, 238 on base, 
Three runs, two homers, five RBIs, a steal, and eight strikeouts. Uh, the steal is important because it obviously tied the category, and you know he let he won uh, he he did win uh, batting average. So I I think I found like the three top guys that were that were hitting on his team because at the end of the day neither of these guys hit very well. They hit two thirty and two twenty five respectively. So. It's not exactly the greatest performance. Pitching-wise, uh, Steven Strasburg gave him 12 great innings, 12 strikeouts, 7 walks you don't like to see, but somehow only pitched to a 108 whip. Um, so he was walking the bases but wasn't giving up any hits. Uh, did give up a home run, a 150 ERA, and a 108 whip. Uh, Rick Porcello, 6 innings, 6 strikeouts, all clean, and a 050 whip. And finally, Brandon Workman, Four relief appearances, three and a third, seven strikeouts, three walks, a save, nothing earned, a 150 whip. So he faced 10 batters, or he got 10 batters out, struck out seven of them. It's fantastic. For Mike, Ronald Acuna gave him a good week before, uh, before I think he might be done for the season. Uh, yes, he is. He has a groin strain. He's done for the year. Um or at least done for the regular season. I don't know if he's going to be making it back for the yeah, playoffs. Yeah, they say he's good to go for the postseason. Okay. They're just going to hold him off. Okay. The and, you know, I was talking to Frank about this, too, on my way to work yesterday. Um, he says, he says, you know, why do we have to have injuries right now? You know, Ronald Acuna is not playing. Freddie Freeman's not playing. I said, what the fuck do you want them to play for? You've won the division. Let them sit and get healthy for the playoffs. You want them in the playoffs. You don't want them now. Well, maybe he doesn't think they're going to be ready, but I, I'm telling you right now, I know for a fact that Acuna is being rested, so they're saying he's yeah. out for the season. Yeah, but, so... You know, just so they can add another, like, roster spot, they can DL him. Uh, rather, uh, I, I L him. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... It's just it, it's just one of those moments where, where I'm wondering, like, you know, Jeff McNeil also went down, who was on Mike's roster. You know, if Mike had made the playoffs, this is a team that, unfortunately right now when it's most important would be just losing their 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 superstar and losing their their top hitter you know oh my god how bad do you think this McNeil thing is do you think they're just you know uh let's see down play I mean let's place McNeil on the 60 day injured list with a fractured right wrist um he'll undergo surgery next week and should be fully recovered by spring training in February so Unless yeah. it's unless it's something that, you know, saps his ability to put the bat on the ball, which is what he does, I, I don't think this is going to be a big deal. Um, it, in a corresponding move, they did activate Dom Smith, so we get to see Dom Smith the final week of the season. Uh, Acuna for the week for Mike went 375 with a 524 on base, six runs, two doubles, two homers, four RBIs, a steal, five walks, and eight strikeouts. Uh, Jeff McNeil, up until the injury, 308 average, 357 on base, six runs, two doubles, three homers, five RBIs, two walks, and four strikeouts. And our big meat, the polar bear, Pete Alonzo, 348 average, 444 on base, seven runs, two doubles, three homers, six RBIs, three walks, six strikeouts. The dude has 51 homers. That's a club record. 118 RBIs. I think that's a club record at this point. You know, it's 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 one of the greatest seasons I think we've we will ever see and have ever seen out of a Mets player, let alone a rookie. Well said, yeah. well said, Joe. I was about to say, like, yeah, not even just a rookie, just like any player. It's just any player that has ever played for the New York Mets. This is top three offensive seasons. Like, there's yeah. There's a Mike Piazza season. There's one where you get Piazza, 40 homers. one Piazza season. Yeah, like there's the there's the Piazza forty homer season. There's the Beltron forty homer season in 06. Um, there's the season that Reyes had when he won the batting title, but that's a different kind of, you know. Todd Hunley ninety seven ninety eight. Yeah. Like this is this is just blowing every single one of those guys out of the water. And here's the thing: he's only hitting two sixty. He can still take another step forward. Like, I don't think that he's much more than a 260 hitter at the end of the day. Like, 
maybe 270, 275 on a career year. But holy shit, like, if he takes that step forward and becomes a 275 hitter, what's his homer total? Like, can he improve on this 51 homers? Like, he's got, what, four games left right now? Yeah, he's got four games left, including the game today. Like, the rookie record is, what, 53 by Judge a couple years ago? No, 52. 52? Okay. So he needs one in the next four, two in the next four to take it himself. But my question is, can he do better than this in any other year in his career? Like, is he I, is he a 50-homer guy every year? I don't know. That's not a thing, though. Like, I've never heard of, like, a typical, like, just an every year 50-home run guy. You know, like, Chris Davis mm. was showing us that maybe he could be that guy. You know, I don't... Right. I don't know because we haven't seen something like that in a long, 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 long time, you know. Right. So, what, to me, if anything, what I'm scared of is that, that you know, we talk about the sophomore slump, mm-hmm. but it's just that who the hell can hit 50 home runs again? I got to assume a regression, that people are going to just assume that this is what he is, and if this is, you know, just the rookie season, what's the next step? What's exactly. he going to be like at age 27, 28, and 29? Mm-hmm. Like, how, like, if he's 24 and he's this big, how big is he going to fill out when he's in his 30s? Yeah. Like, he could be like a Babe Ruth type of body, mm-hmm. you know, and just keep crushing balls forever, basically. So, I don't know, man. I'm excited about it, but I just don't know. You know me as a Mets fan, typically pessimistic, mm-hmm. always uh, tempered optimism, and uh, try to go from there. But uh, always cautious when I think about it. I'm just thrilled that he's got this opportunity to maybe tie Judge. Um, I have a feeling that would bother a lot of Yankee fans if he tied Judge or even beat th- that record. It would even be worse. Yeah, if he but, can um, hit two homers in know, a game just to just to sort of stick it to the Yankee fans. They're going to be really, really salty about the fact that uh, Pete did this. Right. No, so I'm excited about it, man. He's an amazing player, and uh, we haven't gotten to have a guy like this that you can say, like, this kid is a man. You know, the way he just, like, won that home run derby. You know, like, Mm -hmm. like, such a man. And it's been so long since we had someone that was, you know, not only a homegrown player, but just, like, seemed, like, so well-bred, like, came from like an amazing family and like the way the, the values and the morals that they brought him up with he's a star he's a superstar in New York City for a long long time I don't think that the Mets have had somebody like this since Mike Piazza like I think this is this is that once in a generation type guy that exists on this team and here's the thing we had to trade for Piazza the Dodgers let him go and his best years were with us you know He's he's our Hall of Famer. I think this is that next generational talent, right? We've gone a long time since we had a real true power hitter. You know, it went from Piazza, and then I guess you can say Carlos Delgado. And then after that was what? For the last 10 years, who's been the power hitter on this team? Uh, no, I mean, you can go through, I can't go even, through a ton of different guys that, you know... You know David missed, Wright like, is not a power hitter, right? David Wright was more no. a 20 or 25 homer guy. Um, no. You know, they're, they're no, just... No, it was Delgado, it was Beltron. Um, but those those guys Lucas, were... Lucas Duda and Ike Davis were going to be the guys for yeah, a little bit. Like... This is not. this is not that. This is not an Ike Davis 30 homer season. Like, this is not... You know, a Lucas Duda 30 homer. This is not those guys. This is something so much better than that. You know, I I look forward to seeing what this kid can do. I absolutely look forward to it. Like, this is between him being the power hitter that he is, between McNeil being the, the, I hate to make a comparison to Jose Reyes, but being the type of hitter like Jose Reyes that he is. With the pitching of Jake DeGrom and, you know, the, the, those three pieces are the, are, are the core of a championship team 
we've just got to fill in the rest. Like, the Yankees were able to run off four championships in, what, five years or something like that with a core of, you know, Jeter and, and Pettit and Posada and Bernie Williams, right? Those four Rivera. guys. Rivera. Uh, Mariano Rivera. If we could have McNeil, Alonzo, DeGrom, and Lugo, for example, four homegrown guys in similar spots, I'm not saying we're going to be a dynasty, but I'm saying this is a this is a really good core, and I'm optimistic on the 2020 Mets season. That's good. I'm glad you are, man. I don't know what to think yet. It's really going to come down to Brody. Mm-hmm. He's got the opportunity to get a second chance here. I want to see what he can do with a second chance. Uh, he didn't do so well in his first chance. Wilson Ramos was a good signing. Yep. Um, and I would say J.D. Davis was a great find. Yes. Uh, other than that, I, I give him an F. And just about uh, overall, I give him a D plus. Maybe a C minus, yeah. just because the team did have an over five hundred. They had a winning season. Mm-hmm. They made it interesting until there were four games left. So yeah, you know, something. yeah. And and here's the thing, right? Cano getting hurt, you can't foresee. And whatever the fuck Mickey and the staff did to Edwin Diaz, you can't foresee. You know, the the team for what it's worth, and I think we talked about this yesterday. They didn't give up on Mickey, and they could have. You know, there was a point in time where this team was really down and definitely could have given up on this team, or given up on this season, given up on this manager. And instead, of all people, it's Pete Alonso that we're talking about here that sort of brings this rallying cry of LFGM. You know, he says, we're going to do something here. We're going to make this happen, and... Until four games are left in the season, this team was in it, and this team was fighting for 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 the playoffs. I really look forward yeah, to, to seeing what they can do with a full season of Stroman in the NL, another season of DeGrom and Syndergaard, you know. And if Steven Matz is the number four, great. I'll be interested to see what they do. If Mickey's or, uh, Brody's going to have to go out and get a five. He's going to have to go get a third baseman unless we're going to play McNeil there or are we going to play J.D. Davis there. Definitely need to go get a center fielder and a real one. I'm tired of seeing Michael Conforto in center field every day. Um, You know, if Nimmo's going to be that guy, then he's got to stay healthy. He's got to progress as a hitter and not be the guy chasing the slider low and away. I love the, 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 the ability to get on base by him, though. And I don't know. I don't know. We're we're tangenting really yeah. far from this. Uh, bring this back we'll around. Get back there. Yeah, we'll bring this back around here. Uh, Mike fires for Mike this week. Uh, his pitching side gave him eight innings, uh, a win, five strikeouts, nothing earned, an 0-2-5 whip. This is the same guy who threw a complete game, a, a no hitter earlier this year when uh, when Mike streamed him, and he's been on his team ever since. Pitched. 15 wins this year. You know, this was a guy who last year was was a pretty much a disaster. You know, and this year, like I said, 15 wins, uh, 391 ERA, a 119 whip. Just a great find there from, from Sherman. Uh, Vince Velasquez gave him a good start as well. Nine and two, uh, two actually two good starts. Nine and two thirds innings, a win, a loss, a homer, two walks, fourteen strikeouts, a two seven nine ERA, a one two four WHIP, and finally Denelson Lamet, six innings, a win, fourteen strikeouts, a one fifty ERA, a one WHIP. That fourteen strikeout game comes in Milwaukee. Um, so thank you for that, for at least extending the ability for the Mets to play because those damn Brewers are the guys who knocked us out this year, even without Christian Yelich. Uh, I have a, a related question. Sure. Uh, Vince Velasquez, as you mentioned, is one of the uh, key pitchers. Uh-huh. Now, did Mike play him on Sunday against the Indians? Let's find out. I would imagine so, because he got both starts. Uh, so did he pitch well? Or did he pitch like... 
Uh, four yeah, and two thirds. Like he did take. He did take the loss, but it looks like he only gave up one earned run on a solo homer. Oh wow! Did get six strikeouts. Oh. Um, now well, so he pitched pretty decently. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah four and two thirds. Yeah, although a lot of those. So he pitched. Uh, okay, so he didn't give up the Mercado homer in the fifth inning. Uh, that was uh, Nick Vincent. However, there was an error in the inning. So, oh, so the he actually gave up, Yeah. So he did. So in theory, he did give up four runs, but only one of them was Got earned it. because of an error in the inning. Okay. Um. Shall we? Shall we jump on to uh, James and Nick's matchup, or is there anything else you want to you want to dive into? Oh, here? Uh, two awesome managers. I appreciate everything again. You know yeah. they're. They're unbelievable. Mike Sherman, former champion in 2016. We'll delve into that year a little bit when we get through the history. Mm. And uh, Chris Levy still waiting for that elusive uh, playoff matchup. You know, he's been with us since 2014. Mm. So, you know, the years they're passing him by, he had to wait another year as he came up so damn close, so damn close, about a stat short. So just better luck next year. And hopefully that whatever it is that, you know, he was missing from this season. He continues to improve. He's learned something as he's learned every single year. So look out for this kid. And, uh, of course, Mike Sherman, a veteran, like you always got to watch out for him too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to next season with these two guys. Um, let's jump over to Nick Homan versus James Santangelo. It was an 11-12 matchup. Uh, Nick gets the win here 14-5. It wasn't close. James... Hasn't been checking his team in the past two weeks that we talked about. So I'm just sort of going to gloss this over. Uh, you can obviously tell that nobody has moved from James's bench all week because he's got 10 guys or nine guys because Christian Yelich is still in his starting lineup. Nine guys all with stats and four guys down below him who don't have any. So like nobody moved. Nobody's done anything. It's, it's pretty apparent that he's done with this. So I'm not going to dw to dwell on it too much. Um, you know, 21 for 83 on the bench, 11 runs, three doubles, a triple, two homers, 14 RBIs, three steals, 13 walks, 29 strikeouts, and four errors, all left on the bench for James Santangelo this week. For Nick, uh, he went 15 for 66. You can tell that he was playing. You know, other than Colin Moran and Alex R and Alex Riley, I really need to stop calling him Alex Riley. He is not. The former WWE superstar. <laughs> he really isn't. He is the shitty. He's the shitty player on Atlanta. Um, Austin Riley is that kid's name. Austin Riley is that kid's name. I, I promise I'll do it a lot more next year as well. Somehow. Um, anyway, other than those two guys, everybody else has stats. So Nick was absolutely checking his team, absolutely setting his lineup, and. You know, credit to him. There's not a whole lot to play for here, especially when you're up against a guy that you know is not going to be competing. And to to James's credit, at least he hit the minimum this week. You know, um, that comes from the fact that Dakota Hudson and Nate Evaldi both had two starts this week. Otherwise, because he only got 38 innings, and he got 20 of those oh, wow. from Evaldi and, and Hudson. So... A oh. pair of starts from each of those guys is what it, what it took to get there. Um, for Nick, sixteen for or fifteen for sixty six on the bench. That's a two twenty a two twenty seven average. Eight runs, three doubles, four homers, nine RBIs, six walks, thirteen strikeouts, and two errors. Doesn't matter. He was playing against somebody that wasn't competing. Uh, key players for Nick. Uh, Miguel Sano had a had a ridiculous week. Three thirty three average, four nineteen on base, six runs, a double, a triple, four homers, eleven RBIs, four walks, eight strikeouts, but did have three big errors, uh, which did cost him that category. Uh, George Springer, two thirty five average and on base, three runs, three homers, five RBIs, and four strikeouts. And finally, Yasiel Puig, five hundred average, five thirty eight on base, three runs, three doubles, seven RBIs, a steal, two walks and five strikeouts. Pitching-wise for Nick, well, welcome back to the season, Luis Severino. For a guy who was missing all of this year with, what was it, a lat injury or a shoulder injury or what have you, he comes back at the perfect time 
for the New York Yankees because now they've got a pitcher and they just lost uh, Domingo Herman for the postseason. Did you hear about this, Benji? Sure. Of yeah. course. Domingo Herman will not be pitching this postseason because I guess he beat up his girlfriend or his wife. So to get yeah, Severino back. Saw it, so. Yeah. Yeah, so to get Severino back, like, it's at least it, it's something that they can build upon. Uh, he gave them. He gave. Uh, he gave Nick two starts here, nine innings, a win, two walks, thirteen strikeouts, nothing earned, an 078 whip. You know, it's disappointing that Nick hung on to him all year, drafted him in the sixth round, and finally gets him back for his first start, September seventeenth. Like you waited until the playoffs to get this guy back, and he's just. I, I think part of it, be part of the reason that that you know you, you you didn't make the playoffs is one is is this guy being drafted in the sixth round. Like he should have he should have gone to another team if you're if you're looking back on this season for for Nick. Um, Jacob Degrom was fantastic for him. Seven innings, a win, nine strikeouts, nothing earned, and 057 whip. And finally, Dan, uh, Daniel Hudson. Four innings, two saves, two relief appearances, two strikeouts, nothing earned in a one whip. Um, for James Santangelo, uh, I mean, Yasmani Grandal had five walks and he won on base percentage. Uh, Howie Kendrick had uh, 529 and a 556 on base percentage for the week. And Marcus Semien has been red hot, 423, 500 on base percentage. Two homers, six RBIs, five runs, and four doubles. Pitching-wise, Andrew Miller gave him five relief appearances. Trevor May gave him four more, and Colin Poche gave him four more. And he won relief appearances going away. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good job, James. Anything to add, Benji? Not much, man. You said it best. Okay. Uh, just, um, you know, for those that competed, it's really, really interesting. It brings up a really, really interesting conversation for us going forward and uh, what's the best way to prepare uh, for the bigs next season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you just get a couple of more weeks of of practice, I guess, in, in preparing for a lineup or preparing, you know, for a matchup. And at the same time, you can say, you know what, I'm good. Football season's here. Let me go to my fantasy football teams. Like, you can make those decisions. Um, I look forward to seeing, you know, what happens going forward next year uh, with these two managers. It'll be, uh, it, it's. I find it interesting. They, uh, you know, it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be fun to see what happens going forward I look forward to, to doing research and, and and preparing for next season as well um, with that that'll cover all of the matchups this week Benji let's go ahead and take a break here so that we can get our uh, our guest on we can start for best and worst give you guys a little bit of a history lesson and discuss the housekeeping that needs to be taken care of here with all of the uh, changes that may be coming next season so we'll be right back after this <laughs> 